All right. Green, green, greens. Hello, hello, hello. What's going on? It's your girl Tiffany. I'm back again, live in effect. And I came back with a part two of the video about the Islamic Golden Age and Temple 2. So, uh, before I get into the topic about the Islamic Golden Age, I want to um I want to recommend some books to the people out there. It's called Black and Science, Volume 2, which is written by Robin Walker. So the volume two goes into West and East African contribution to science and technology and intellectual life and legacy of Timbuktu. two. All right. So in this book, I meant to use it earlier, but I didn't get a chance to get around it. But anyway, in this book, for example, it goes into the uh, science and technology history about West Africa. So now let's go ahead. For example, look at, um, on page 22, it says, on page 21, astronomy at Timbuktu. So it says, Michael Palin in his TV series, Sahara, said the imam of Timbuktu has a collection of scientific texts that clearly shows the planets circling the sun. They, they date back hundreds of years. It's convincing evidence that the scholars of Timbuktu knew a lot more than their counterparts in Europe. In the 15th century in Temple 2, the math mathematician knew about the rotation of the planets, knew about the details of the eclipse. They knew things which we had to wait for 150, almost 200 years to know in Europe. All right. And it says, when Galileo and uh, Corpornelis came up with these same calculation and were given a very hard time for it. So it talk about the astronomy uh, studies that was uh, happening in Timbuktu at the time. And it says, um, however, now all scholars are agree with all of this. A, a new scientist article gave the following information on Timbuktu astronomy. While they may have got it wrong about the motion of the, the planets, the manuscripts revealed Reveals the scholars had precise methods for defining the Islamic calendar, including algorithms on how to determine leap years. The algorithms were as accurate as anything math mathematicians have today, as Madupe found when he tested them against the modern computer-based approach. These people were very knowledgeable about the subject they wrote about, he says. Other manuscripts dating back 600 years includes beautifully drawn diagrams of the orbits of planets, which demonstrate the use of complex mathematical calculation. There are also recordings of astronomical events, including a meteor shower in August of 1583. Another manuscript discusses the use of astronomical instruments to determine the direction of Mecca. So, if you guys know about the direction of Mecca, right? When people are praying, it's like northeast to the Kaaba. Okay, so northeast to the Kaaba will be going north and going east. So it's like a certain type of angle. It's like a nine degree angle, sort of. So that's the direction people would have to go. That was the main reason why mathematics was very important, Islam, because that way they could be able to calculate what direction they had to pray when it came down to making their salats and stuff. All right. So, uh, and then go further down this book, it says, Professor Rodney Dibe Madupe, a South African astrophysicist, is the leading authority on Timbuktu astronomy. He wrote in, he wrote the 2009 film documentary, The Ancient Astronomers of Timbuktu. I would like to check that out. He illustrated a number of astronomical themes in the documentary using specific Timbuktu manuscripts, such as the direction of Mecca, the Kaliba, Kala for the five day daily prayers using spherical trigonometry and a simpler method using the Numa. It says calendars, the lunar and the solar calendar systems, and the difference between various calendars around the world. A method to calculate leap years, side quadrant. Use, using information from a manuscript, the researcher used a quadrant to tell the time by measuring the angle of the sun. 
information from a manuscript to show how to use the 28 lunar mansions to tell the time at night. And then it goes on to say, a copy of manuscripts with tables originally written by renowned medieval Egyptian astronomer with calculation and information on the position of the planets, moons, and stars. All right, so I'll just give y'all a glimpse of it. So it come from this book right here. Once again, you guys can check this out. It's called Blacks and Science Volume 2 by Robin Walker. All right, so he's pretty much a historian that's out of Britain and a Pan-Africanist. So he has studied a lot on information and history about um, science and mathematics when it came down to black people in various parts of Africa during different time periods. So just make sure you guys get this book. And also, I recommend you guys get this other book right here, which is called Science Itself, which is written by Supreme Understanding and C. Best Law. So in this book, right, it goes into... Uh, of course, it talks about science because the brother that wrote this, he's a five percenter. So he's in the nation of gods and earth. And they deal with a lot of scientific concept, you know, so they get a lot into science. So they have similar ideology like those of the Sufi, but they're just more so about the I self, uh, Lord and Master, and uh, arm, leg, leg, arm, head. That's their concept. But it's a great book. And it's a beginning start because you learn about different scientific methods, scientific ideology, uh, different branches of science, such as astrophysics, uh, physics, psychology, um, biology, etc. It goes into all of that. So if anybody in a beginning start of knowledge, I would recommend, I would strongly recommend to get this book, book called The Science of Self. All right. I strongly recommend this. Okay. Anyways, so in this book, he goes in and talk about um on chapter what, what page is this? Okay, under what is, what is the scientific method, right? And so page twenty three. So real quick, it says, where does the scientific method come from? It's now known as the Western scientific method, but this approach as the, as well as empiricism in general has its roots among original people in knowledge, belief, and witchcraft, analytic experiment in African philosophy. Barry Halen and J.O. Sadipo describes how the Yoruba have a tradition of empiricism that distinguish Emo from Ibabo. They grade knowledge by varying degrees of Uto, with the highest knowledge being what one has firsthand experience of. That is, when you lack the firsthand experience, your emos comes with some degree of Ibagbo. When an elder dies, a library burns. Indigenous proverb. Okay, so again, it comes from this book. All right. Um, so going further down, it says, if nothing else, Muslim scholars preserve knowledge from throughout the ancient world and diffuse it among cultures thousands of miles apart, all while improving their own understanding by comparing findings from the from these distant schools of thoughts. During this process, numerous Muslim scholars helped to shape the Western scientific method as we know to as we know it today. By 800 AD, Abu Jabir had introduced control experiment to the scientific process eight centuries before Galileo. Our Rawi pioneered the peer review process in his ninth century book, Ethics of the Physician, to ensure that physician met, met the standards of medical care. 10th century Egyptian polymath Ibn al Haddam develop modern scientific methodology. His process involved observing the world, stating a problem hypothesis formulation, testing the hypothesis through the control experimentation, analyzing the result, interpreting the data and making conclusion, then publishing the findings. Around the same time, Abu Rahan al-Biruni understand the possibility of mistakes and bias emphasized the need for repeated experimentation. 
Meanwhile, Ibn Sania, also known as Avicenna, contributed heavily to a dozen of hard sciences as well as metaphysics and philosophy. This period between the 10th and 14th century is known as the Islamic Golden Age of Science. All right. And it says when the Moors occupied Europe from 711 to 1492 AD, they introduced their knowledge to European scholars, effectively saving Europe from its dark ages and ushering into European Renaissance. Although in the early 1600s, Galileo was one of the first Westernizers recognized for setting up formal experiment and explain the result using mathematics, the rest of Europe was slow to accept his observation. In fact, he was tried by the Christian Inquisition, who found vehemently suspect of hearsay, forced to recant and spend the rest of his life under house arrest. All in the name of religion, right? The science of self. Check this book out. Okay, so now I just want to get those two out the way. So now let's get into the concept about the Islamic Golden Age period and its history. <laughs> All right, so. Okay, so Islamic Golden Age, all right, it was a period of cultural, economic, and scientific flourishing in the history of Islam, traditionally dated from the 8th century to the 14th century. This period is traditionally understood to have begun during the reign of Abbasid Caliph Harun al-Rashid with the inauguration of the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, the world's largest city by then where Islamic scholars and polymaths from various parts of the world with different cultural backgrounds were mandated together and translate all the known world's classical knowledge into Sarati and Arabic. Okay. The period is traditionally said to have ended with the collapse of the Abbasid Caliphate due to Mongol invasion and the siege of Baghdad in 1258. A few scholars date the end of golden age around 1350 linking with the tamir renaissance while several modern historians and scholars place the end of the islamic golden age as late as the end of 15th to 16th century meeting with the age of the islamic gunpowders the medieval period of islam is very similar if not the same with one source defining it as 900 to 1300 CE, okay? So these are the different scholars during the time period. I mean, you see their drawings, you see their statues and whatnot. All right, so the history of the concept, it says the metaphor of a golden age began to apply in the 19th century literature about Islamic history in the context of the Western aesthetic fashion known as or orientalism the author of a handbook for travelers in syria and palestine in 1868 observed that the most beautiful mosques of the malchus were like Mohammedans itself now rapidly decaying and relics of the golden age of islam and it says there is no unambiguous definition of the term and depending on whether it is used with a focus on cultural or on um, military achievement, it may be taken to refer to rather desperate time spans. Thus, one 19th century author would have it extend to the duration of the caliphate or to six and a half centuries, while another would have it ended after only a few decades or Rashidun conquest with the death of Umar and the first Fenita or Fintna. All right. So because things were declined during that time period, right? And things were just going to a dark ages. 
the Muslim had to figure out, well, how can we go about being able to, to pick things back up as far as um, as far as civilization is concerned and intellectually. So they had to come up with knowing that Islam was not just the only thing that was going to save them. So they had to deal with the mathematics, deal with the science, deal with the technology, and they had to come up with different techniques of being able to calculate things, being able to go about doing research, and being able to uh, produce items to keep the economies going. So that's all it is, basically, if you just want to put it in that nutshell, okay? So that's like the main reason why the go age period took place. So basically all these different caliphs all the different Islamic leaders, they all had something available other than just Islam. They had, you know, they were math mathematicians, scientists, they were uh, philosophers, they were uh, they were educators, all these different things. All right, so now let's go down to where it says it was only in the second half of the 20th century that the term came to be used with any frequency. Now, most mostly referring to the cultural flourishing of science and mathematics under the caliphate during the ninth and uh, to the 11th centuries between the establishment of organized scholarship in the house of wisdom and the beginning of the crusades, but often extended to include part of the late eight and or the 12th to the early 13th centuries. Definitions may vary, still vary, Considerably equating the end of the golden age with the end of the caliphate is a convenient cutoff point based on a historical landmark, but it can be argued that Islamic culture had entered a gradual decline much earlier. Thus, Khan identifies the proper golden age as being the two centuries between 750 and 950, arguing that the beginning loss of territories under Harun al Rashid Washington after the death of al. Mamun in 833 that the Crusades in the 12th century resulted in a weakening of the Islamic Empire from which it never recovered. All right. So now let's look at the uh, education. So go down here to where they talk about education. The centrality of scripture and its study in the Islamic tradition helped to make education a central pillar of the religion in virtually all times and places in the history of Islam. The importance of learning in the Islamic tradition is reflected in a number of hadith, a tribute to Muhammad, including one that instructs the faithful to seek knowledge even in China. This injunction was seen to apply particularly to scholars, but also to some extent to the wider Muslim public as exemplified by the dictum of al -Zar Zarnuji, learning is prescribed for us all. While it is impossible to calculate literacy rates in pre-modern Islamic society, it is almost certain that they were relatively high, at least in comparison to their European counterparts. All right, so then it talks about how education would begin at a young age with the study of Arabic and the Quran either at home or in primary school, which was often attached to a mosque. Some students would then proceed to training in Tasif and Fig, which was seen as particularly important education focused on memorization, but also train the more advanced students to participate as readers and writers in the tradition of commentary on the study text. It also involved process of socialization of aspiring scholars who came from virtually all social backgrounds into the ranks of the Lulima. All right. Now, um, now go further down. Oh, go further down. It says, while formal studies and addresses were open to were open only to men. Women of prominent urban families were commonly educated in private settings, and many of them received and latter issued ijaz ijazas in hadith studies calligraphy and poetry recitation. Women, working women learn religious texts and practical skills primarily from each other, though they also receive some instruction together with men in mosques and private homes. Mm, isn't that interesting, right? Right. Oh, and then go further down. It said the University of 
Carlo Uni Carlo Une founded in 859 AD is listed in the Guinness Book of Records as the world oldest degree granting university. The Al Azhar University was another early madrasa now recognized as a university. The madrasa is one of the relics of the Fatimid Caliphate. The Fatimids traced their descent to Muhammad's daughter Fatima and named the institution using a variant of variants of her honorific title Al Zahara. Organize, organized instruction in the Alzar Mosque began in 978. So basically, these universities was around for a reason because many of individuals were training to become scholars and which which are sheikh and caliphs are leaders and of course imams. So it's no different than when you have like seminary schools for people who want to become ministers of bishops or pastors or whatnot they go to these seminary schools to study theology and all of that that was the same way during the islamic period so many of them study into becoming caliphs they was going to become um sheikh imams and all of that they studied these things they had to learn the quran they had to learn uh the hadith they had to learn about the jurisprudence they had to learn all these different things that was required in the Islamic culture. And of course, they had to be well versed in learning about the STEM, the science, technology, engineer, mathematics, because that was part of being able to continue on with the economics, continue with the uh, political structure, uh, the social structure, and be able to like help build the um, empires of that time period. So, yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of science in Islam, okay? Now, one of the brothers had put me on some game that in Islam, or I think in the Quran somewhere, they speak about evolution. But it doesn't speak about evolution in the sense of how we speak evolution. But evolution is spoken in the Quran. So it's something I would have to look up and find because I don't have the information in handy. But that was what was told to me at the time. All right, so of course, uh, let's skip down just a little bit. Let's look at philosophy. All right, so philosophy Ibn Sina or Avicenna and Ibn Rashid or Averroes played a major role in interpreting the work of Aristotle, whose ideas came to dominate the non-religious thought of the Christian and the Muslim world. According to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, translation of philosophical texts from Arabic to Latin in Western Europe led to the transformation of almost all philosophical discipline in the medieval Latin world. The influence of Islamic philosophers in Europe was particularly strong in the natural philosophy, psychology, and metaphysics, though it also influenced the study of logic and ethics. Mm. So yes, check this out. Uh, Ibn Sayyina argues his floating man thought experiment self concerning self awareness in which a man prevent a sense. I mean, prevented a sense experience experience by being blindfolded and free falling would still be aware of his existence. So let's look up what the floating man is. Let's look that up. All right. So what is the floating man? So floating man, flying man, or man suspended in air is a thought experiment by Avicenna to argue for the existence of the soul. The argument is used to argue for the knowledge by present. Okay. So then you go further down. It says the floating man argument is concerned with one who falls freely in the air. The subject knows himself, but not through any sense perception data. Floating or suspending refers to a state in which the subject thinks on the basis of his own reflection without any assistance from sense perception or any material body. This mind flutters over the abysses of eternity. Okay, premises of the argument. According to Avicenna, we cannot deny the consciousness of the self. His argument is as follows. 
It says one of us must su suppose that he was just created at a stroke, fully developed and, and perfectly formed, but with his vision shrouded from perceiving all external objects created floating in the air or in the space, not buffered by any perceptible current of the air that supports him. His limbs separated and kept out of contact with no other, with, with one another, excuse me, so that they do not feel each other. Then let the subject consider whether he would affirm the existence of himself. There is no doubt that he would affirm his own existence. Although affirming the reality of anything, of, of any of his limbs, or in inner organs, his bowels, or hearts, or brain, or any external thing. Indeed, he would affirm the existence of this self of, of his of his while not affirming that it had any length, breadth, breadth, or depth. And if it were possible for him in such a state to imagine a hand or any other organ, he would not imagine it to be part of himself or a condition of his existence. Mm. Now that's pretty deep. That, that, that's a deep logic right there. That's very deep. Um, so let's go in a little further about this. So what does it say? It says this argument relies on an introspective thought experiment. We have to suppose a man who comes into existence fully developed and formed, but he does not have any relation with sensory experience of the world or his own body. There is no physical contact with the external world at all. According to Avicenna, this subject is nonetheless necessarily conscious of himself. In other words, such a being possesses the awareness of his own existence. He thereby believes that the soul has an unmediated and re reflexive knowledge of its own existence, thus appealing to self-consciousness. Avicenna tries to prove the existence of the soul or nafs. This argument is not supported by the concept of substance in metaphysics. This uh, exponential field shows that the self is not consequently a sub substance and thereby there is no subjectivity. On the other hand, some scholars like uh, Winoski believed that the flying man argument proved the substantiality of the soul. Ibn Sina believed that in, innate awareness is completely independent of sensory experience. So that's some deep stuff right there, to be honest. That's very deep. So basically, that goes into the concept about uh, the self-awareness and consciousness on that level. So that floating man argument uh, knows that uh, his body, but he also believes that he has a soul. So I guess what he was trying to do at that time, um, Avicenna was trying to use the concept of how the soul can be proven to exist just by the man flying in the air and floating. So, yeah, but of course, you know, that was his metaphysics. That was his uh, hypothesis. Um Scientists today might argue against it and say, well, you can't use the floating man concept as a way to actually prove that the soul does exist. Because at the end of the day, you can flow all you want to, but do we know actually that there is a soul? So it could be argued, it could be argumented, it could be debatable, it could be questionable, and all of that. Um, but I thought that was just very that's very deep. That's very deep. I have to look more into the floating man. I'm a little more into that. Okay, so let's go down to here about the epistemology. So anybody that doesn't know epistemology, epistemology is the study of knowledge in itself. So you studying the knowledge that you have received. So let's just click on epistemology so that way it can make sense. So it's the branch of philosophy concerned with knowledge. So epistemology study the nature and origin and scope of knowledge. Okay. So as I always say that philosophy, I say this, philosophy is an introduction to knowledge. Epistemology is the study of that knowledge. And science is the application of knowledge. So that's just how I... Ooh. That's how I remember things. Um, that's the way I remember things. 
and it helped me to understand. So epistemology is the study of that knowledge and philosophy is the introduction of knowledge and science is the application of knowledge. Yeah, so that's the way it helps me to memorize stuff. But let's go ahead and continue. Um, okay. So epistemology, Ibn Tufayil wrote the novel Ha Ibn Yaqadun in response, Ibn al-Nafis wrote the novel Dialogus Aldatis. Aldatis. Both were concerning Aldatism as illuminated through the life of a feral child spontaneously generated in a cave on a desert island. All right, so for those who don't know what is autodidact, so being autodidact or autodidactism is being self-taught, being self-educated. And the opposite of autodidact is didactic. Didactic means being taught by someone else or an institution. But autodidact means to be taught by self, being uh, educated on self, you know. That's all. Okay, so right here, Theologus Autodidacus, which uh, translate into the self-taught theologies. All right, so it's actually a book. It says, originally titled The Treasy of Camille on the Prophet's Biography, also known as Falat Fadil Ibn Natat. The book of Fadil Ibn Atat is a theological novel written by Ibn al Nafis. Okay. It may be prototypical science, science fiction novel. Okay. So now. And then here's this book, it's called Hey Ibn Yak Yakadan. So it says, Hey Ibn, oh, Hey Ibn Yak Yakazan, a live son of awake, is an Arabic philosophical novel and allegorical tale written by Ibn Tufali or Tufal in the early 12th century in Al Andalus. The name by which the book is also known included the Latin Philosophis Autodidactis which is the self-taught philosopher and English, the improvement of human reason exhibited in the life of Hab Ibn Yokadan. Hey, Ibn Yazan was named after an early Arabic philosophical romance of the same name written by Avicenna. During his imprisonment in the early 11th century, even though both tales had different stories, the novel greatly inspired Islamic philosophy as well as major in Enlightenment thinkers. Okay, so here's the book right here. And it was translated from Arabic by Simon Oakley. The history of Hay Ibn Yahzan. All right. All right, so let's just see real quick. Say the story revolves around Hey Ibn Yakzan, a little boy who grew up on an island in the Indies under the equator, isolated from the people in the bosom of the antelope that raised him, feeding him with her milk. Hey Oha has just learned to walk and imitates the sound of antelopes, birds, and other animals in his surrounding. He learned their language and he learns to follow the action of animals by imitating their instinct, which that normally happens with children. You know, children can pick up on a lot of things very fast. He makes his own shoes and clothes from the skin of animals and studies the stars. He reaches a higher level of knowledge of the finest astrologers. His continuous exploration and observation of creatures and the environment lead him to gain great knowledge in natural science, philosophy, and religion he concludes that at the 
basis of the creation of universe, a great creator must exist. Ha Ibn Yazan lived a humble, modest life as Sufi and forbade himself from eating meat. Once 30 years old, he, he meets his first human who has landed on his isolated island by the age of 49. He is ready to teach other people about the knowledge he gained throughout his life. So, wow, that's very deep. Um, that's very deep. Again, we'll look into more information about those two books. All right, so right down here, let's look at mathematics. It goes into the algebra of Persian math mathematician Muhammad ibn Musa al Khwarizmi played a significant role in the development of algebra, arithmetic, and Hindu Arabic numerals. He has been described as the father or founder of algebra. All right. So some people argue that algebra was uh, started in Africa. But then others uh, argue that it was started by the Muslims during the uh, Islamic uh, Golden Age era. So that's different debates and arguments on that. <coughs> <coughs> and however, the number system that we use today, some of us use Roman numerals, and Roman numerals sometimes can be be very complex, especially when it comes towards like dealing with the um tens and whatnot. But the number the the uh, numbers that we use, which is the one, two, three, four, five, those symbols, those are called uh Arabic numerals. So that's how they saw Arabic numerals one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Because again, it was very popular within the Islamic culture with the Arabs and the Middle East, African culture, whatnot. Okay. All right. So it says another Persian math mathematician, Omar Kalyam, is credited with identifying the foundation of analytic geometry. Omar Kalyam found the general ge geometric of the cubic equation. His book, Treasy on the Demonstration of Problems of Algebra, 1070, which laid down the principle found, I mean, yeah, laid down the principle of algebra is part of the body of Persian mathematics that was eventually transmitted to Europe. Yet another mathematician, Sharif al din al tusi found algebraic numeral, numeral solutions to various cases of cubic education, I mean, equations, he also developed the concept of a function. All right. So let's skip down to trigonometry. Uh, Ibn Mu'ad al-Jalani is one of several Islamic mathematicians to whom the laws of science is a tribute. He wrote the book of unknown arts of a sphere in the 11th century. This formulate relates to the length of the size of any triangle rather than only right triangles to the size of its angle. According to the law, sine A over A equals sine B over B equals sine C over C. Where A, B, and C are the lengths of the size of a triangle and A, B, C, the uppercase letters are the opposite angle. All right. So then you go down to calculus. Al Hazin discovered the sum formula for the fourth power using a method that would be generally used to the, determine the sum up for any integral power. He used this to find the volume of parabolic. He could find the integral formula for any polynomial without having developed a general formula. Mm. All right, so then you go into natural sciences. All right, so scientific method. Ibn al-Hadan 
was a scientific figure in the historic history of scientific method, particularly in his approach to experimentation and has been described as the world's first true scientist. Um, Avicenna made rules for testing the effectiveness of drugs, including that that the effect produced by the experimental drugs should be seen constantly or after many rep repetitions to be counted. The physician Raziz was an early proponent of experimental me medicine and recommend using control for clinical research. He said, if you want to study the effect of bloodletting on a condition, divide the patients into groups, perform bloodletting only, only on one group, which watch both and compare the results. All right. Then, of course, they talk about astronomy. Uh, Persian astronomer Abdul Rahman al Sufi, write in his book of uh, Fifth Stars, describe a nebulous spot in the Andromeda constellation, the first definitive reference to what we now know is the Andromeda galaxy the nearest spiral galaxy to our galaxy nazir al-din al-tusi invented a geometrical technique called a tusi couple which generates linear motion from the sun of the circular motion to the to replace tomali's problematic equant the tusi couple was later employed in ibn al shatir's geocentric model and nicholas Cornicis, Cornicis, or Cornicus, or however the hell you say his name, heliocentric model. Although it is not known who is the intermediary is or if Corponicus discovered the technique independently, the names for some of the stars used, including Rachel and Vega, are still in use. All right. So, anyways, um, it goes into a lot more information uh, right down here, as you can see, about engineering, of course. Uh, the Banu Musa brothers in their book of in ingenious devices describe an automatic flute player, which may have been the first programmable machine. The flute sounds were produced through a hot steam and the user could adjust the device to various patterns so that they could get various sounds from it. All right. And then under here, you see what it says, social science. See how many more minutes I got left. All right, so under here, it talks about social science. So social science is regarded to be among the founding fathers of modern sociology. Oh, excuse me. I mean, Ibn Khaldun is regarded to be among the founding fathers of modern sociology, uh, historiography, demography, and economics. Archiving was a respected position during this time in Islam, though most of the governing documents have been lost over time. However, from correspondence and remaining documentation gives a hint of the social climate as well as, sh as shows that the archives were detailed and vast during their time. All letters that were received or sent on behalf of the governing bodies were copied, archived, and noted for filing. The position of the archivist was seen as one that had to have a high level of devotion as they held the records of all pertinent transactions. Okay, then you got, got the hospitals, healthcare, of course. So I ain't gonna go in too much, but it says the earliest known Islamic hospital was built in AO5 in Baghdad by order of Harun al Rashid, and the most important of Baghdad's hospital was established in 9, 982 by the Bayid ruler Abdul al Duwala. The best documented early Islamic hospital are the great Syro Egyptian establishment of the 12th and 13th centuries. By the 10th century, Baghdad had five more hospitals, while the Madakis had six hospitals by the 15th century, and Cor Cordoba alone had 50 major hospitals, many exclusively for the military. Okay. Then, of course, it talks about pharmacy. Arabic scholars use their natural and cultural resources to contribute to the strong development of pharma pharmacology. They believed that God had provided the means for a cure for every disease. However, there was confusion about the nature of some 
ancient plants that existed during this time. All right. And then going further down, medicine. Of course, it says the theory of humorism was largely dominant during this time. Arab physician Ibn Zaire provided proof that scabies is caused by the itch mites and that it can be cured by removing the parasites without in the need of purging, bleeding, or other treatments called for by humorism, making a break with the humorism of Galen and Ibn Sina. Rises different, differentiated through careful observation to the, the two diseases, smallpox and measles, which were previously lumped together as a single disease that caused rashes. This was based on location and the time of the appearance of the symptoms. And he also scaled the degree of severity and prognosis of infection according to the color and location of rashes. Al Zarari was the first physician to describe an ectopic pregnancy. And so for those that don't know what an ectopic preg pregnancy is, that's when the baby is stuck in the fallopian tube and it's not going to, you know, it doesn't go into the womb. So when the baby is stuck in the fallopian tube, that's, they call that ectopic pregnancy, which can lead to miscarriages and all. And the first position to identify the hereditary nature of homophilia. So what is homophilia or hemophilia? Hemophilia is mostly inherited genetic disorder that impairs the body's ability to make blood clots, a process needed to stop bleeding. This results in people bleeding for a longer time after an injury, easily bruising and increased risk of bleeding inside joints or the brain. Ooh, and when you get that bleeding in the brain, that, that's the worst thing to have. Those with a mild cases of the disease may have symptoms only after an accident or during surgery. Bleeding into a joint can result in permanent damage while bleeding in the brain can result in long-term headaches, seizure, or a decreased level of consciousness. So it's called hemophilia. All right. So we're going to talk about surgery. And of course, it says Al Zarawi was the 10th century Arab physician. He is sometimes referred to as the father of surgery. He described what is thought to be first attempt at reduction of mammoplasty. Oh, which is with mammoplasty. All right, excuse the image, you guys. <laughs> okay, so mammoplasty refers to a group of surgical procedures, the goal of which is to reshape or otherwise modify the appearance of the breast. So that is a breast reduction, basically. And Augmentation, augmentation of mammoplasty is commonly performed to increase the size, change the shape, or alter the texture of the breast. This usually involves the surgical implant or breast implant devices. So basically to give a breast implant and reduction mammoplasty is commonly performed to reduce the size, change the shape, or alter the texture of the breast. Um, th this involves the removal of breast tissue. Okay, so... So, yeah, so basically, um, going back, it says, yeah, the first to attempt a reduction of mammoplasty for the management of gynecomastia. All right. And the first um, mastonomy to treat breast cancer. He is... Cre Credited with the performance of the first thyroidectomy, which I guess that's the, the removal of your thyroids or something. Yeah, or your thyroid gland. He wrote three textbooks on surgery, including Manual of Medial Practitioners, which contains a catalog of 278 instruments used in surgery. All right. 
So, I mean, that's all I have for the little Wikipedia. I'm not going to go any further. So if you guys want to read more, you can. But um, I also want to check out some more information and show you guys some more that you guys can look for yourself. Ooh, child. All right, so right here I have a book. Well, I have several sources, but this particular book right here This particular book right here is called The History and Achievements of the Islamic Golden Age, Course Guide Book. Okay. Of course, um, it was written by Professor Leshra Anaman Giron in 2017. All right. So you got the Leshra Guides from Camels to Stars in the Middle East. Uh, Ibn Batuta's Search for Knowledge. Let's check that out. All right, so it says, Ibn Batuta's Search for Knowledge. Uh, the 14th century Moroccan name Ibn Babuta was the greatest warfarer and excruciatist of his day. He once wrote that traveling leaves you speechless, then turns you into a storyteller. In this lecture, you will examine the story of the Muslim world through which Ibn Batua traveled from Tangier and beyond. Okay. So, so yeah, basically you guys can, uh, I'm not going to go any further, but you can check this book out. And I'll also make sure I post it on my Facebook account for those who want to uh, look more into it if you're interested. Okay. All right, so also I have another one which is called Science and Technology in Medieval Islam. All right, so do you guys see it? Cool. Let's go. That's that's what's up. All right. So right here it says science will. Yeah, science, technology, and medieval Islam. Of course, where is Islam? I'm not, not going to go into that. Now, the golden age of medieval Islam. The early Islam spread rapidly from its centers uh, in the Middle East to the West, Cairo, across North Af Africa, and into the southern Spain. All right. So Arabia was at the crossroad between Asia, Africa, and Europe, and the Arab people trade widely with merchants from places as diverse as China, India, and Southern Europe. Trade and conquest led to cultural exchange and the spread of knowledge. The practical problems of trade over long distance also led to the development of techniques for navigation by the stars and a greater understanding of time. Great centers of scholarship were established in cities such as Baghdad, which is in modern day Iraq and Alexandria. Okay. So science, technology, and medieval Islam. Science and learning in medieval Islam. Okay. So early Islamic teaching encouraged and promotes the pursuit of scholarship and science. Seeking knowledge about the natural world was seen as the duty of every Muslim as the following hadith says of Prophet Muhammad shows. He who pursued the role of knowledge allowed would direct to the role of paradise. The scholar's ink is holier than the martyr's blood. All right, so things that improved the quality of life like science and technology were encouraged and welcomed. These included practical things like navigational aids for travelers, geographical maps, med medical knowledge, ways of measuring and calculating, and tools for agriculture. All right, the use of paper and books was very important in sharing, promoting knowledge in early Islam. The Muslims learned how to make paper from Chinese paper makers and a paper mill was built in Baghdad. A huge book industry was established and there were bookshops and important libraries in cities right throughout the Islamic empire. 
wealthy patrons or patrons promoted this industry by buying expensive book often lavishly illustrated for their own private family libraries all right so i'm just gonna stop it right there and if you guys want to check this out it's called science technology in, in, in medieval islam so i'll make sure i post that up on my facebook page for those who are on facebook okay all right and then i have another book here it's called All right, it's taking too long to load up. This thing getting on my nerves. Okay, thank. All right, so right here, this book is called Islamic Science and Engineering. Islamic Science and Engineering. In 1993, that's when it was written by Donna R. Hill. All right. So it goes into the introduction, the antecedents of Islam, the inventing of Islam, translation of scientific work into Arabic. Of course, it talks about mathematics, arithmetic, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, astronomy, folk astronomy, source of Islamic astronomy, a spherical astronomy, basic theory, timekeeping, determination of the Kibila, crystalline visibility, uh, planetary theory instruments, observational instruments, celestial globes, uh, astro, astrolibbles, sundials, quadrants, equatora, and observ, observ, observation or observatories, um, astro, astrology, of course, because you got to remember astrology. Uh, gave birth to astronomy, just like alchemy gave birth to chemistry. But that's a long, yeah, that's a long one to go into. But anyways, uh, physics, mechanics, and optics. You got chemistry, alchemy, arif arifashion, uh, my macro biotics, history of Islamic alchemy, substance equipment and processes let's look at the hmm let's see which one i want to look at so let's look at the sources of islamic astronomy on page 33. <laughs> Okay, sources of Islamic astronomy. So it says the early Islamic work related to mathematical astronomy were based upon Indian and Sassanese works. With very few exceptions, these early Islamic works are lost and our knowledge of them has been pieced together from later citation. As early as the 8th century in India, Afghanistan, there were compiled a number of Arabic... Pull this up. Okay, Arabic zajids, that is astronomical handbooks with texts and tables. The most important to representative of the Indian tradition was the Zajid al Sinhin of al Khwarazmi. The, I mean, only fragments of the original text survive, but we have Latin translation of the revision made by Majority in Cordoba. All right, indeed, there seems to have been a strong audulution predilection for Sinhid. The few Eastern representatives of the tradition are known mainly from quotation in the work of later astronomers. All right. So that's very interesting. I never heard of Islamic astronomy to now. 
So it says the available original sources enable us to distinguish our four main periods of Islamic astronomy. First, a period of assimilation and zikralization of earlier Hellenistic, Indian, Sassanid, mathematical astronomy and pre-Islamic folk astronomy. Second, a period of vigorous investigation in which the superiority of Ptolemaic astronomy was accepted and significant contribution were made. Third, a period when a distinctive, distinctively Islamic astronomy flourished in general continued to progress if the if with decreasing vulgar. And finally, a period of stagnation in which this traditional Islamic astronomy continued to be practiced with enthusiasm, but without innovation of any scientific significance. All right, there we go. So let's see what else I can find in this book. This is an interesting book. I'm glad I came across it too. Hmm. Let's look at. Um, the history of Islamic alchemy. All right, so it's page 79. All right, so <clears throat> history of Islamic alchemy. In the West, alchemy came into being Hillelistic Egypt. The writing of Hillelistic alchemists themselves has survived only in a number of fragmentary manuscripts, many of which carry the names of legendary or celebrated figures such as Hermes, Isis, Moses, and Cleopatra. The oldest of these writings is probably the pseudo uh, Democritus, who I mean, which can be dated to the early years of the first century AD. The other writings were composed later from the second to the fourth century AD. An important figure was uh, Zosimus of Panopolis, who around AD 300 wrote an encyclopedia of alchemy, parts of which has survived. Oh, Lordy. A considerable number of Greek writings were translated into Arabic. Indeed, it's clear from references in the works of Islamic alchemists and biographers that many more Greek works were known to the Muslims than have come down to us. There is no doubt, therefore, that Hellenistic alchemy was a major influence on its Islamic counterpart. We must be careful, however, not to assume that only the only sources of Islam alchemy were, were Greek simply because the written transmission from I mean, were from the Greek pseudographs. The whole course of Hellenistic protochemistry was primarily metallurgical, while Islamic joined with Chinese alchemy in the profoundly med medical nature of its preoccupations. Macrobiotic ideas appear in the Jabarian writings and in the works of other Arabic alchem alchemical writers, and it seems almost certain that they were imported from China, where the characteristic form of Chinese alchemy had existed since the 4th century BC. All right, it says no translation of Chinese works are known from the early century of islam but the two cultures had commercial relations from eighth century on onwards and non-literary transmission could have occurred in alchemical matters as we know they did in other fields for for example in paper making and in techniques of siege warfare all right so It says, for the beginnings of Islamic alchemy, we only have the reports of a legendary nature in the works of later alchemists. Although there may have been other early Muslim scholars who were interested in the subject, undoubtedly the most important name in the early Islamic alchemy was that of Jabir B. Hayyan, long familiar to Western readers under the name of Jibbert, the medieval render of the Arabic name. 
So you guys can go here on archive.org and check out this book, which is called The Islamic Science and Engineering, okay, by Donald R. Hill. Yep. So it goes into more details about the STEM, Islamic STEM, which stands for Tech, Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics, and, or you could call it STEAM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. All right. Okay. So with that being said, that's all I have for you guys and there's a lot of information to cover um also you know talking real quick well you know what i'll talk about that later anyhow but anyways you guys can check out more information uh thank you for those of you that was watching on this youtube channel and facebook so make sure if you want to share the video, you're more than welcome to share the video. If you want to subscribe to the channel, please do so. If you like the channel and you like the content that I post, go ahead and like it. If you don't like it, then that's fine. I can deal with that too. All right. So until then, I hope you all have a good one. You all be safe. And Ramadan Mubarak to all the Muslims out there that are observing the Ramadan. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah to all of you. So until next time, uh, take it easy, peace and power and elevation. And if you guys uh, just come in, for those who want to come in and watch the video, you have to watch it from the beginning to see what the subject I'm talking about. All right. But until then, you all have a good one. All right. Take it easy. This is your girl Tiffany, and I'm logging off. Peace.